As you can tell, I'm about to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, how many of you were aware before you came here tonight that the Dawn spacecraft went in orbit around Ceres? Oh, look at that. Yay. See, people are really excited. We're all terribly excited. And uh, so we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, the mission manager and chief engineer for the Dawn spacecraft with us. And before you join us, Mark, I'm going to, uh, well, I don't know if I'll embarrass you. I might try by showing you this video. Well, he knows. He participated in it. So he knows what this video is uh, that tells you a little bit more about our speaker tonight. We're in the control room for a space simulator here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And one of the reasons I think this is so cool is this room is right out of the Starship Enterprise. This to me looks like Scotty's console in engineering or maybe auxiliary control. Scotty, we're suddenly off course. Check out maneuvering controls. Hey, that hold. <laughs> <laughs> We need time for the phase inverters to stabilize before we can activate the matter-antimatter injectors. <laughs> It'll take at least 15 hours. Get together what you need and beam down here with them. Top priority. <laughs> <laughs> spend all this time sneaking off to do Scotty impressions during his lunch break. You see, he's actually been rather busy, well, uh, being Scotty. Dawn will be the latest probe to use ion propulsion, a revolutionary new system that uses electrically charged atomic particles as fuel, propelling crafts <laughs> ten times faster than if they used regular old-fashioned rocket fuel. Sounds pretty cool. Guess where they got the idea from? I worked on a mission called Deep Space One, which was the first interplanetary mission to use ion propulsion to travel around the solar system. And the first time I ever heard of ion propulsion was in the Star Trek episode, Spock's Brain. <laughs> Aliens come to the Enterprise, and before they do their dastardly deed, Kirk walks over to Spock and says, What do you read, Mr. Spock? Configuration unidentified, ion propulsion, high velocity, though a unique technology. And Scotty says, oh, I've never seen anything like a, an ion propulsion at that. They could teach us a thing or two. And so the opportunity to connect what I saw in Star Trek as a little kid to what I'm doing now as an adult is very, very exciting. Well, Thank Mark, you. before I say another word, I want to say, and I'll say on behalf of everybody, or maybe we all want to say congratulations. 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 Thank you, Well, I would say to everybody, welcome to series. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, that's a really fun video. How long ago did you make that video? That was, I think, 2006. Uh -huh. So that was quite some time ago. Uh -huh. I love the smile that you have when he says, you know, you can beam down to the planet. You look very excited about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it was also fun because William Shatner has sort of made a career out of having no shame. And so, <laughs> So it's fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, we did cut out a little bit just to shorten it, but uh, you mentioned that he calls you a propulsion engineer, but you're not. Can you say a little bit about your background? That's right. Well, I have a doctorate in physics, like other people here, but uh, I've been a space enthusiast since I was four. Uh -huh. uh, I saw. I used to be afraid of witches, like, you know, like Wizard of Oz type witches. Well, they're scary. And, yeah. Right, they are. I, I'm getting over it now, but, <laughs> uh, but I saw a meteor when I was four and thought it was a witch. And when I discovered or learned that it wasn't, that it was something from space burning up in the atmosphere, I became fascinated with it. And I've been a space enthusiast ever since, wow. interested in science and astronomy. I started writing to JPL, where I work now, when I was nine years old. <laughs> and That's so it's, it's pretty gratifying to so work So how many there. letters did you write before they said, OK, you can come work here? <laughs> More than a few. <laughs> That's just great. And uh, tell me what your role is at JPL. What do you do? Well, now I'm the mission director and chief engineer for Dawn. So I get to be responsible for basically every technical aspect of this interplanetary mission. And can it's you say a, a few words about Dawn? So those who, how many of you don't know anything about Dawn? There must be some. Okay, there, there are right. several. So tell them from the beginning. <laughs> What's Dawn and why do we care? Okay, Dawn was launched in September 2007. And today, so after a journey of seven and a half years and more than three billion miles, it went into orbit around the first dwarf planet ever discovered, Ceres. And uh, it was discovered in 1801. So the way I like to think of it is it's, it's this celestial it's orb that's been 
beckoning for two centuries, and finally today, Earth answered this cosmic invitation. And I think that's really neat. That series started out as a planet. That's right, when it was discovered. In fact, astronomers were looking for a planet between Mars and Jupiter. There's a frequent mistaken notion that Giuseppe Piazzi, who discovered it, was actually looking for a planet. He wasn't. But there was a group of astronomers called the Celestial Police that were, <laughs> that were looking for a planet between Mars and Jupiter. Because even before Uranus was discovered in 1781, they thought that there could be a, another planet there. Piazzi discovered it by accident. And it was called a planet for years, for more than a generation. In fact, if we'd been having this conversation 200 years ago, the, the two differences I like to point out are your home internet connection wouldn't have been as fast, <laughs> and the other is you would have learned in school that Ceres was a planet. Yeah. But then in the middle of the 19th century, more and more objects started to be discovered in this part of the solar system. And so they began to think, well, we shouldn't call this a planet. And so they called it an asteroid, and sometimes a minor planet. Then in 2006, everybody remembers the International Astronomical Union insulted Pluto, yes. right? How could we be so inconsiderate? Why were we the big planetary bullies? Why didn't we account for Pluto's feelings in the matter? Well, whatever you think of that, at the time Pluto was put in the category of dwarf planets, Ceres was included in the same category. So it's a dwarf planet. It's the first one discovered. And uh, whatever you call it, uh, a planet, uh, an asteroid, a minor planet, a dwarf planet, today, Dawn calls it home, uh. and that's what I like. And we have a video that shows kind of the improving view uh, that has been seen from the Dawn spacecraft. There is just a bunch of pixels. Right, and, and here, this is about exceeding the resolution that we had from Hubble, and now here it's still substantially better, getting better still. And now we're traveling to the night side, and so, we, the night side. <laughs> that's right, or, or the dark side. Yeah. Uh, and so we're not going to get any more pictures until April. But when we do, they're going to continue to get better and better. Over the course of the year, they'll be, I think the last one you showed was maybe February yeah, 25th. Yeah, uh, February 25th. And I kind of want to do it again because I want to point out that white spot. That's okay, just but been I was going to say the pictures forever. we're going to get during the course of the year will be more than 100 times better than the ones we just saw. We're going to get closer to the surface of this alien world than the space station is to Earth. Wow. wow. So I'm going to show this again, and we have more pictures as well. So there's just nine pixels. And you'll see this white spot on it that Hubble saw. There it is. Years ago, there it is again. Yeah. So as we got closer, it was like, it's still there. What is this crazy white spot? And there's the uh, closest approach on the 25th. We have a couple more. Oh, David, do you want to comment yeah, on this? Yeah, oh. I was uh, looking around for just information on Ceres and came across this is an actual uh, conference. Uh, and you can see, Ceres and Dawn, your last chance to talk about Ceres before Dawn data wreck your theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So these astronomers have their theories of mud volcanoes and ice ledges, all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, this is the guy that's going to say, no, sorry, no, that doesn't, no, that can't happen either. That's part of the fun of exploration. Yes, it is. So uh, this was the, um, or is, was and is, the trajectory as it spirals in, just what you were talking about, about how we've, we're moving further away. Right, and this morning, we're at the place indicated capture by Ceres gravity. So. Prior to that point, at 4.39 a.m. today, I'm sure you were all up paying attention. <laughs> were you up? Uh, actually, I was, but only coincidentally. Uh, <laughs> I just, I happened not to sleep well. But mission control was empty. We didn't have anybody monitoring it. The spacecraft was taking care of things on its own. And so we didn't need to, didn't need to interfere or even observe. Right, just, you do all the work, Don. I'm tired. That's so right. Is, yeah. That's right. Um, so... Uh, just prior to that, it was in orbit around the sun, just like Earth is, and right after it, it's in orbit around Ceres. And now it's continuing up to an altitude that will, of uh, 47,000 miles that it will reach on March 19th. So that will be obviously right out here. And then it's going to come down. And each one of these gaps, these opnavs, refer to optical navigation pictures. So the pictures we have just seen were optical nav pictures. So you can see we have this long period here where we don't take any. But then we'll resume taking them April 10th, April 14th, and then at the end of the trajectory here is when we're in our first intensive observation orbit. 
at an altitude of 8,400 miles. But uh, again, during the course of the year, we'll, we'll spend a while there, and then we'll go lower and lower and lower until in December we're at about 230 miles. Wow. So here are and some of the there, images we've yeah. gotten. Yeah, go ahead. And I just think, I mean, how can you not be mesmerized looking at this picture? It's these two, I mean, to me, they're just beacons glowing out from these uncharted lands ahead. And it really, to me, it makes you want to send a spacecraft there to find out what the heck is going on. Let's do it. So Thank that's what we're doing. We are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so those, that white spot was resolved into two. And we still That's don't right. know what it is. We still don't right? know what but it is. And each individual spot is still unresolved. Yeah. So these pixels are um, about two and a half miles across, which means these spots each are smaller than two and a half miles. We don't have any more information on them. Any ideas? What? Cities. Lots of ideas. I mean, the most popular idea is that they're alien cities, right? <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, to me, that's ridiculous. And the reason is, we don't know whether they live in cities there or not. It could be rural communities. <laughs> you know, they, they may have, maybe they have states. We don't know what the geopolitical structure is <laughs> on Ceres. So I feel like, and, yes, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, I would say that's so, the movie-making capital yeah, of Ceres, because right. those are the spotlights coming from That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so Ceres itself is relatively dark. For you astronomers, it's got an albedo of 9%. For the rest of us, it means it's, it reflects only 9% of the light that impinges on it. So it, uh, it's often compared to asphalt. It's dark. These bright guys reflect at least, we don't know how much, but at least 40% of the light. The reason we don't know how much is because we have a pixel this big that's lit up, but we don't know how big the object in it really is. If it's very small, then it's reflecting much more light, and it's filling up that pixel. So 40% is a lower limit. That is, it could be substantially more reflective. So we don't know. But one of the really cool things about Ceres, and there are many, besides the fact that it's the largest object between the Sun and Pluto that a spacecraft had not yet visited until now, is we know it has a substantial inventory of water. Most of it is likely in the form of ice, but there may be subsurface liquid water, maybe ponds or lakes or maybe even oceans. There could be subsurface oceans at Ceres. And even if there aren't now, there may have been at some time in the past. So one of the things we want to look for is evidence on the surface of interaction between the subsurface water and the surface. Is this evidence of that? I don't know. No, we, uh, there was an observation by Herschel of That's water right. vapor. Right. And did it coincide spatially with this? Is it in the same area? It did. That's an excellent question. So Herschel is the Herschel Space Observatory, named after the astronomer William Herschel, who many of you have heard of. He discovered Uranus and did many other important things. And it was reported in January of last year that the Herschel Space Observatory detected water vapor around Ceres. And the question is, did that come from cryo-volcanoes? Think of this, cryo-cold volcanoes, which are basically like geysers. Or is it ice on the surface that's sublimating and just sending water vapor into space? We don't know what the origin of it is, but they were able to narrow down the likely source to two bands of latitude, uh, sorry, two bands of longitude that is somewhere in a strip from the north to the south pole and one of them happened to go right across here mm. so yeah. it's hard not to tantalizing it's very tantalizing i can give you a totally unofficial personal opinion that what we're not seeing here is ice mm. that it's a very attractive thing to think but herschel's results can be explained by, and I apologize, I normally am prepared to give things in English units, but I'm not with this one. It can be explained by just 0.6 square kilometers of ice. So let's see, what would that be? A uh, quarter of a mile. Um, square root of 0.6. Yeah, it, it'd be um, around 150 or so acres. I think I did that correctly. Wow, convert to acres in your head, that's impressive. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, well, but who knows whether I got it right or not, right? Okay. We're going with it, yeah. it's good. Uh, so it's a, but it's a relatively small area of ice, and so I think these are too large for that, because even if they're 100% reflective, given the size of the pixels in these pictures, 
would have to be too large. I, I could be wrong about that. We'll have to see. Mm. But I don't think it's ice. But it could be evidence, again, of maybe just as one other example, maybe it's salt deposits. Maybe water came up from the surface, made its way to the surface, froze, and then sublimated and left behind this bright deposit. Hmm. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. It'll be fun to find we'll out. We'll find out. We happily. will. Yeah. So here's a movie of uh, series rotating. Series rotating, so you right. can see all the different faces yeah. of it. Best images yet. And there are some other bright spots that aren't yeah. the same. There are, and we don't know what they are either. Yes. Some of those look like they have rays coming off of them. They do, and the so presumably that's right. They're impact craters. And one of the expectations before we got to series, because we we are confident that there's so much ice there is that the craters would be relaxed. That is, if you imagine pushing on your skin, when you, take, when you stop, it reverts to its previous form, right? Because your skin is soft. Not, not that guy's, but everybody else's. Um, and the same thing may happen on series. That is, you form a crater, but over the time scale of a few million years, the ice may gradually relax and erase the record of that crater. So one of the things we want to understand now that we're there to actually see them is what does the record of the craters and what do their shapes, that is the depth and the diameter, whether they have central peaks, what do these things tell us about how much ice is in the surface and below the surface? How, how, how plastic is it? How well does it flow? I have a question. If you could go back to the picture that shows the two dots, um, I notice... I don't know if these are just artifacts because it's of resolution, but there seem to be uh, linear They're features. not artifacts. Uh, they we aren't. We believe that indeed they are linear features on the surface. So it's more than just, more than just a bunch of craters and a couple of white dots. You could um, have like vents or something maybe? or could be vents. It could be... <laughs> Landing Another possibility, strips. pardon me? Landing strips. Uh, well, that's or, what I was thinking. Or taking <laughs> off, right? I mean, you have to go both directions. Um, it could be. But another possibility is, again, a world of, of ice may have, at some time in its past, changed its size and shape, right? Because it was warmer early in the dawn of the solar system. Uh, Get it? Get it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's Woo! not an acronym. It's referring to the dawn of the solar system. It was warmer early on when it had more radioactive materials in it. And so it's highly likely that there was a substantial liquid ocean there. Again, we don't know how much there is now, but as it froze, you would expect the surface to change its shape. And so maybe that's evidence of stresses in the surface from that. Maybe it's a result of impacts that have yeah, stressed the surface. We don't know. Um, a lot of good questions, not many good answers yet. But that, to me, is part of the fun of exploration. Question. Oh. Bright spots, are, are they stationary? Do they seem to be like consistently in the same area, or do they move around? No, no, they're, they're consistently, they're surface features. So uh, these two spots, as you saw in the picture that Dr. Danley showed earlier, they've been there since dawn was approaching, and in pictures observed from Hubble in uh, about a decade ago. Only now do we see them at this level of detail, but they're fixed on the surface. Although one of the things, uh, just to finish that off, one of the things we're going to be looking for is, do they change, I mean, when we get more and more detail, do they change over the course of our exploration there? Which would be cool. That's one of the great things about being in orbit rather than just flying by. <laughs> just very quickly, what I noticed that seems really strange to me is in that GIF of the, that shows the rotation of the, of the uh, look right into the Terminator if they stay bright. They do, uh, but if you look at it very carefully, and it's a little hard to tell in this, in this rotation, uh, they, they do disappear when they go into shadow. Oh, yeah. but, uh, so they're not emitting light, they're just reflecting yeah. light. But still, they, they hang on for quite some time. It's impressive. Which means a huge phase angle for the reflectivity. That's right. Which is That's interesting. Right. What could yeah. that be? Good questions. We don't know the answers yet. <laughs> But how bright they are as a function of the angle of the illumination and the reflection is one of the things that we look at, this phase yeah. that you referred to. Cool. Question. So I was wondering, now that you're, now that you're like there, how long do you plan for the mission, the fact gathering mission, to last? Mm -hmm. Well, the primary mission is scheduled to end in June of next year. And it's likely that, in fact, it's, it's highly likely that before then, 
we will have completed all of our objectives. It's unlikely that the spacecraft will survive that long. Hmm. And even if it does, Aww. it's unlikely it would survive much longer. And the reason for that, this is a little technical, but the spacecraft carries devices called reaction wheels. These are disks that are spun electrically, and you, uh, by changing the speed at which they rotate, you can cause the spacecraft, in fact, we do cause the spacecraft, to rotate around them. And that's how we stabilize spacecraft. And uh, we need three, so in the usual conservative way, the spacecraft was built with four, but two have failed. And for some missions, this could be catastrophic. We lost one in June of 2010 and the second one in August of 2012. And when the second one failed, it was not as good a day on the mission as it is today. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Nevertheless, the flight team has managed to come up with a way to complete the mission without any wheels. So we, we have arrived at, at series with what I call a zero reaction wheel plan. So e the way I like to think of it, I mean, we had two, two wheels fail. How much confidence can we have in the remaining wheels? So the way I like to think of it is we have two failed wheels and two doomed wheels. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, we are currently not operating the operable wheels, and we're not even going to turn them on again until December. We're going to do all of our investigations without them. But to do that, we're using up a supply of small rocket propellant called hydrazine. You know, you squirt it out of a thruster here, and that causes the spacecraft to rotate like this, and you squirt it out of a thruster here, and it causes the spacecraft to rotate like that. That's not how we intended to fly the mission, but that's how we're doing it now. We've undertaken a major hydrazine conservation campaign that's allowed us to stretch it out to do actually more than we had planned at Ceres. When we launched, we didn't know about these Herschel observations of the water vapor around Ceres. But at the end of this month, uh, sorry, at the end of next month, we're going to be making special observations to try to investigate that. We didn't even have that planned. We're going to do everything else we had planned, but we're going to use up the very last drops of hydrazine doing that. So uh, sometime between about a year from now and later next year, we'll run out of hydrazine. And the way I like to think of it is the spacecraft will just become a big, inert monument to human creativity and ingenuity. <laughs> and that's where the mission's going to end. Were these reaction wheels the same as that we used in the uh, Kepler spacecraft? They are. Yes. So Kepler, of course, a well, much more well-known spacecraft searching for planets around other stars. I have friends and colleagues working on Kepler, and uh, they we talk about reaction wheels a lot. Yeah. Reaction <laughs> wheels are problems with a lot of spacecraft. Actually. They are. Why don't they figure out how to make better reaction well, wheels? Well, actually, they have. There are other designs that are preferred now. And so the design that we have on board Dawn and Kepler and some other spacecraft, you couldn't even buy now. So if any of you is in the market for reaction wheels. <laughs> uh, reaction you, wheels that'll break. That's right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Are there? Run out of hydrazine. Is it possible that you could? Uh, complete your primary objectives and go out and find a third as uh, asteroid? Mm -hmm. Well, we absolutely will complete all of our objectives before we run out of hydrazine. I'm very confident about that. But we are not going to go elsewhere. Uh, we, the best use of this spacecraft will be to continue to study Ceres. It's the most interesting object in town. I mean, it's a big place. It's got 38% of the area of the continental United States. I mean, it's often misleadingly compared to the size of Texas. But to me, that's like comparing a soccer ball to a flat sheet of paper. Right? Ceres has four times the area of Texas. Hmm. Not as many rodeos, but it's, got, it's, got, it's a big place. And we will never, that's right, it's a good point as far as we know. Uh, but we will, we will never run out of worthwhile things to do there. So we're going to. Uh, time for two more questions. There and there. Yeah. Is there a plaque on the spacecraft like some of the other spacecraft? There isn't a plaque on the spacecraft, but before launch we collected names of people who, I mean, if you submit your name. So there are the names of 330,000 people uh, and some of their greetings uh, in a little microchip on the spacecraft. Yes, last question. 
Am I correct in assuming that, that the planet has an active core that's giving off heat to keep the, uh, the liquid flowing? Yeah, for th those of you in the back, the question was whether, the, whether Ceres has an active core that's giving off heat. It's not active, but it's warmer than the exterior. And that's because it, it has in it radioactive materials that it incorporated when it formed, just as Earth's core does. Um, now, we don't know about the details of it, of course. We will be studying the internal structure of Ceres with the spacecraft when we get down to the low altitude. But models, mathematical models, suggests that even over the lifetime of the solar system, four and a half billion years, it would still, it might, I should say, might still have enough heat that there could be a layer of liquid water under the surface because of the flow of heat from the core toward the surface. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Did you find any history of volcano activity? Well, the question was, have we found a history of volcano activity? We haven't. I mean, the pictures you've seen here are are what we've got so far. So we're just at the very beginning. Those pictures were taken just as we're flying in. So here's now a mosaic of the surface of Ceres. You can see just to the right of center those two brightest dots peering at you out of the, the crater. There's another, I think, particularly interesting feature here. Some people call it the sand dollar. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little bit bigger than a sand dollar. I think it's, um, it's nearly 200 miles nearly 200 miles across, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting that it's, it's got such a polygonal structure and looks to be relatively shallow. Um, on the icy moons of the outer solar system, there are many uh, hexagonal or polygonal craters that are observed, and the reason that's believed for that is because an impact occurs into a crust that is already below the surface broken up. And so it sort of follows some of the natural lines, which is why you can get these, these uh, straight line features from an impact. Whether that's what's going on here or not, we don't know. We don't know a whole lot more than you can just see right here looking at this picture. We just got these in the last couple of weeks, and there's still a lot more to do in analyzing these and, of course, getting more. So, in fact, artifacts or? Uh, say again. There's a lot of straight lines in that. Are those artifacts or? Um, or they, I guess I don't see a lot of. Yeah. Well, those, right mean, those are artifacts. Oh, these are artifacts. These are artifacts. Here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Those are artifacts. So yeah. I'm okay. Last question. I was just going to ask. You, you mentioned the mission objectives, and I'm actually not familiar with that list. Oh, when I refer to the mission <laughs> objectives, I mean the specific measurements we want to make at Ceres. <laughs> So we want to fully map the surface in visible and near-infrared. We want to take spectra, spectra, of course, where you break up the light into its constituent colors. Just like when you look at the light through a prism, you see all the colors, literally, the colors of the rainbow. We're going to do that in the visible and infrared, which will tell us what the minerals are on the surface, what is the surface made of. We'll measure the elemental composition, that is, what are the atomic constituents, what are the atoms in the surface, and we will measure the interior structure of Ceres. How is the mass distributed inside? And over the course of the mission, as I mentioned, we're, gonna, we're on our way now to our first intensive observation orbit at 8,400 miles in altitude. Then we will lower the altitude to 2,700 miles, then 900 miles, then 230. So, so that, that's a summary of the objectives. And oh, so and, and so just, we're if I just mention, one, mention one more, that is searching for moons around Ceres. Oh. Oh. And we have been doing that. That's continuing. The reason I bring that up is, as I also like to point out, we, so we've been searching for moons. We haven't found any in the pictures. But as of today, we know Ceres does have one. Oh. Its yeah. name is Dawn. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so just throw that in. Oh, Mark. So, the poetry, the poetry. So the plan of going, getting closer and closer and closer will let us wildly speculate about each of those better resolution. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. right. Is that? That's yeah. right. So, so that means you still have the opportunity to have theories which will be proven exactly. to be wrong. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. 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 So these are the parting shots. I'm going to move along uh, just so we can uh, get to our final segment. Parting shots uh, after closest approach. Right, closest approach. But that's because we're, we're flying this side. complex... Uh, this a complex approach trajectory. I like to think of it as something that would be the envy of any Cracker Jack spaceship pilot. Yes. So okay. we're uh, zipping. I will show the video in a moment. Oh, we will. Okay. So let me just get there. Okay. And this was from today. Yeah. And 
I like this mostly mm -hmm. because, to be perfectly honest, I think it's a really cool picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, just think it's very pretty. So as you can see, Dawn is getting further away, just like that diagram showed. And here is the trajectory ah, that you were right. mentioning. So here it is flying, thrusting with its ion propulsion system, which we'll talk about more, but using that to maneuver into orbit. Here it is raising its orbit to go over the poles, and then in late April it stops thrusting because that's the first orbit that it's in. And so it's a, it's a really, truly unique way of going into orbit around an extraterrestrial body. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and I don't think we'll be able to talk about ion. See, you were right. That's fine. We won't have time to talk about ion. There are plenty of fun They mentioned to it talk in about. that movie. Uh, the, the William Shatner mentioned it. It was like, ions, what are those? <laughs> but it is a yeah. different propulsion system that allows you to... Right. It's, it's what allows us to undertake a mission which, in 57 years of space exploration, this is the only spacecraft ever to orbit two extraterrestrial destinations as of today. And the reason for that is because of ion propulsion, which I truly did first hear of in <laughs> Spock's brain from Mr. Spock. If you want to know more about it, go to our website, dawn, D-A-W-N, dot J-P-L, dot NASA, dot gov. You can even read my monthly blog there, Dawn Journal, and you can learn all about ion propulsion and series and other things, and you can even see ion propulsion was in the Star Wars, TIE Fighters, twin ion engine. <laughs> well, we have three ion engines on Dawn, so we do the TIE Fighters one better. Go to the website, you can see lots more about it. Um, with that, I think our last picture is indeed of the last asteroid That's right. that you visited. This is the visited. first destination that we went to, Vesta, mm -hmm. which is the second most massive object in the main asteroid belt. And In fact, just Vesta itself is about 8% of the mass of the main asteroid belt. Ceres is around a third of the mass of the main asteroid belt. So there are millions upon millions of objects in the main asteroid belt, and Dawn is single-handedly exploring 40% of the mass of the asteroid belt. <laughs> and Vesta is always recognizable by the snowman. That's right, which in fact actually you can also see here on my necktie if you're yeah. paying attention. <laughs> and, uh, and so just for scale, this, this crater here is about 45 miles across or so. And the southern hemisphere here there's a crater 300 miles in diameter. Think of that. People think of asteroids as chips of rock, right, the size of mountains or buildings. This is much bigger. And in the center of that crater is a mountain that soars to two and a half times the height of Mount Everest above the surface. So this, is a, this was a really spectacular place to explore.